God in John chapter 6 verse 39 you you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life it is these that testify about me do not think that I will accuse you before the father the one who accuses you is Moses in whom you have set your hope for if you believe Moses you would believe me for he wrote about me and if you not believe his writings you will not believe my witness. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so glad that we have your scriptures today. Your, your word, the Bible, doesn't just contain your word. It is the very words of the living God. Right down to the tense of the verbs, Father, it is all written and authored, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And Lord, it all testifies about Jesus Christ because, Father, everything Everything from created order to the consummation of all things is about making the name of Jesus Christ above every name. And Father, that's what we want to do today. We want to lift up Jesus. Father, we would see Jesus high and lifted up and glorified and magnified, the King of kings and the Lord of Lord, the Savior of men and women who give their lives to him. So, Father, we pray that you would enable us to do that today in everything we do, whether it's praying or singing 
or listening to the preaching of the word or listening to the teaching of a Sunday school teacher, may Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, be lifted up in this place today and we'll be very careful to thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to take just a moment to... uh, well, first of all, I'll tell you what we're doing. If you're here and you're a guest, we're in a revival. We have really, truly been blessed. If you've not been able to be here the last two nights, you've, you've been really missed a blessing. We've heard two tremendous messages from, uh, so obviously already you know I'm not preaching. Uh, oh, come on, take your hairnets off. Let your hair down. That was funny. I don't care who you are. Uh, wake up. <laughs> now, Dr. T.J. Betts from uh, Louisville, uh, Kentucky from uh, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He is the Associate Professor of Old Testament Interpretation at Louisville, and uh, he's an interim pastor. He's pastored for many years, and uh, he's a husband and father of two boys, and and we look forward to hearing from him today, and you're going to want to introduce yourself to him after service. But anyway, if you're here and a guest, that's what's going on today, and uh, we're glad that you're here. We always get excited about our guests. And they, we got some guys that's going to come forward, and we got a, uh, somebody up in the balcony. And, and while they're coming forward, let me ask you to do one thing for us if you're a guest. Uh, on the right-hand side of it, if you open your worship bulletin, on the right-hand side is a tab that provides a place for you to fill some information out about yourself. And that would give us a record of your visit, and we would really appreciate it. If you would do that, fill it out, tear it off, drop it in offering plate when it comes by. Now, these guys standing here are really anxious to spring into action. They want to give you a gift package. So if you're here today, we're not going to embarrass you. Just lift your hand up in the air right now, and real quick, we'll get this into your hands. Would you do that? All right, lift them up. Got one on the back row, Ed. All right, thank you. Anybody in the back? Don't want to miss anybody. We we got everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, We are really honored that you're here today, and our prayer is if you're a guest, that you'll be blessed from the minute you step on our campus till the minute you leave. All right, we got one other thing we need to take care of as the uh, deacons, ushers would uh, come forward. We have deacon election today, and uh, the guys are uh, getting ready to start handing out ballots to you. I believe we have three men, three names on the ballots, but you also have a uh, place to where you can just check a box, say, look, I vote for all three, okay? So what we're doing here, uh, first of all, don't take one of these if you're not a member of Bel Air Baptist Church. Only members can vote. But we're going to hand these out and uh, give you the service to finish filling yours out. But at the end of the service, as you're leaving the building, there will be men stationed there for you to turn your ballots in. If you don't turn them in this morning, you're not going to get a vote in because we're going to count them, you know, after service, and that will be the vote. Okay? Everybody with me? All right, guys, you all go ahead and spring into action. All right.
Let us pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing that we've already received this morning by coming to your house. Father, thank you for the music and the songs that we've been able to give praise to your name this morning. And Father, as we come to you on this Revival Sunday, Father, we especially pray for an outpouring of your spirit. Father, I pray that you would just touch each and every heart that's here. Father, you would allow us to lay everything aside that may have been going on this week to, Father, just focus on the name of your Son. So, Father, that we may leave here revived, Father. Father, as we come to this time to give our tithes and offerings back, Father, please remind us that everything we have comes from you. And, Father, that we would just give joyfully when we have this time to do so. And if you'll do all this, Father, we'll give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
to you today from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 2. For you are our letters written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being mes- uh, manifested that you are the, a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And such confidence we have through Christ towards God, that we are adequate, we are not adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. But our accuracy is from God, who has also made us accurate as servants of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. If you are able, will you kneel with me as we pray? Just take a moment and think about things that you try to do in your own strength. Maybe think about a a problem or or a trial in your life that you say, I can handle this in, in my way. Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, as I think about those things in my life that I did try to do on my own, Lord, as I don't fully trust as I should, I try to live in my own strength. Lord, remind me that I'm a letter to all men. And Lord God, if I'm not living in your strength, I'm not telling a good story. Lord, I'm not telling the truth of who you are. Lord, we're not adequate in ourselves. Lord, it's only through our our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, it's only through the one that you sent down the cross for our sins. Lord, the one that spilt his blood that we are adequate, Lord, that we are different than this world. And, Lord God, we have to be different. If we're not different, then we give the the enemies of God a reason to blaspheme your name. Lord, I don't want that in my life. Lord, I want to be a light. I want to be a reflector of your goodness and your grace. Lord, I want the song that we're singing to be true is that you are the air I breathe. Lord, I want you more than food, than more, to, than, more than, than, than drink. Lord, I want you more than a night to sleep. Lord, I want that to be evidence in my life, and I pray that's evidence of this church as this local body of Bel Air Baptist Church, Lord God. Lord, that we can proclaim that you are the air we breathe. You are our daily bread. Lord, we need revival so bad, Lord, in our churches. Lord, we need men and women of God to stand up and to be those, Lord, that stories have been written on the hearts, on our hearts. Lord, give us this strength, Lord God, as, as Dr. Betts brings your word. Lord, I pray that it changes lives. Lord, we can't sit in these pews and hear this word and and, and be able to walk out the door without proclaiming the truth of the word that we heard. Because you are the air we breathe. Your word is our daily bread. And we're desperate for you.
morning. If you have your Bible with you, please take your Bible and look to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. And while you're looking to that, I would just like to express my gratitude for your having me and what a joy it's been to be with you these few days. And I've especially been blessed to get to know your staff and get to also spend some time with your pastor and his wife, Brenda, and, and it's just a wonderful thing to see what God is doing in your midst, and I appreciate again your having me here this weekend. Looking at Exodus chapter 14, it is a passage that is probably one of the most familiar passages really in the Bible um, with folks that don't even go to church. Uh, it may not be the most known, but it's one of, the, one of the top known passages because it talks about the Exodus. And I have to admit to you, it's very difficult for me to even think about the Exodus without picturing in my mind the movie, The Ten Commandments. And um, it, it has taken me years to try to do this and I haven't quite accomplished it yet. But when I think of Moses, many times Charlton Heston flies into my mind and Yul Brenner, and uh, it, it's just a, a great movie. And if you haven't seen it, you ought to. Um, I, it's not completely biblically correct. That's an Old Testament professor talking there, but it's still a thumbs up, okay? So I would um, encourage you to um, watch that. 
But as we look at a story like the Exodus, many of us that have grown up in Sunday school, we've heard it many times, we've seen the movie. And it's important, I think, for us to make sure that we don't get so familiar with the story that we do not get the message of what God is doing there with his people. And so today I would like us to read some verses from Exodus chapter 14. And I would like us to look at what God is doing and what God did with his people and what God still does with his people today. Let's read beginning with verse one. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before pi ha Haroth between Migdol and the sea. You shall camp in front of Baal Zephon opposite it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him. And he took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them by camping by the sea beside Pihaharoth in front of Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the events surrounding the Exodus were written for us, the church. And so it is important for us to understand what is this message? What is it that we need to learn? What is God telling us and revealing about himself to us here in Exodus chapter 14? I think it's interesting to note at the very beginning how the Lord tells Moses and the people to turn back to a place where they will be shut in by the wilderness. You have this picture that the people have come out of Egypt. God has put 10 tremendous plagues upon the Egyptians and the Egyptians could stand no more of what God was doing. And so they sent these Israelites out and really just get out of here, take what you want, just get away from us. And the Israelites saw God's work here. And I can imagine that as they were going out, they were thinking we're finally free and we're going to make it. And they, they're looking ahead and thinking this God who has shown himself powerful in Egypt and has brought us out, who knows what great things he's going to do. And they're anticipating just wonderful work that God is going to do in their midst. And we talked about last night having a hope for the future. I believe they had a bright hope. They were thinking, man, this can't get anything but better. And God is providing for us. God is fighting for us. Everything looks wonderful. We're done 
with these Egyptians and we're done with the slavery and all the terrible things that we have gone through all these years. And then the Lord speaks to Moses as they're getting away and it looks like they're through with these Egyptians. And he says, turn around and I want you to go this way. I want you to, to go to a place where you're going to be shut in. And then I'm going to harden the Egyptians' hearts. I'm gonna harden Pharaoh's heart and they're going to come to destroy you. And you're like, what? I thought we were done with the Egyptians. You're having us turned our direction and go to a place where they're going to be able to wipe us out? I'm not sure about this strategy, Lord. I'm not sure that this is how things should be working. And I think that as we look at this, I think it's important for us to realize that there are times that God leads us to places that are unexpected. He leads us to places that if we were the ones thinking about what is the best strategy here in doing the work that God wants to do, we might do this and yet the Lord does something very different and calls us and leads us to a place very different than what we would even choose. And we're thinking this strategy just, it just doesn't make sense. What is going on with this? And you know, sometimes the Lord leads us to unexpected places, isn't that right? He leads us to unexpected places. I think about um, the whole idea of something happening that's unexpected. I heard about a man who uh, he heard this young lady sing. Her name was Matilda. And Matilda had just a beautiful voice. And this man would hear Matilda and he, he just fell in love with Matilda. His, her voice was just so wonderful and it's just like the angels in heaven singing. And he, he was smitten by her and he finally got up the nerve one day and asked her to marry him. And uh, she said yes. And they set the date and that date came, they got married and it was their wedding night and they got to their room and he looked and he looked across the room and he saw Matilda. And Matilda then took off her wig. And then she started taking off her makeup. And then she took out her teeth. And then she took off her wooden leg. And he was shocked looking at this. He, he didn't have any idea. And all that he could say is sing, Matilda, sing. <laughs> and sometimes life is unexpected, isn't it? And things happen that we just aren't looking for it to happen. But know that God often leads his children to places that we just wouldn't expect. We don't think that this is the way it's supposed to be. And yet it's exactly where God is at work because God wants to show the world through his people that he is the Lord. Do you realize that the Lord, if, you, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he did not save you just for you. All he loves you completely and ultimately, but he didn't save you just for you. He didn't save me just for me. He saved us so that we would be a witness to this world, to who is the Lord and who is the savior and where salvation comes from the Lord and from him alone. The Lord wanted the Egyptians to know for certain that the Lord, he is God and that there is no other. And so many times God will take his people to very unexpected places to teach us that we can trust him in all situations, but also to use us so that we would be a testimony in this very lost and dark world. And we need to recognize that. I have to say though, I don't always respond that way, do you? When things happen and, and it looks like a situation like the Israelites felt here, they're like, what have you done, Moses? Are there not enough graves in Egypt? Do you need to make some more graves out here? What they're saying is you brought us to our death. What is going on here? This makes no sense. We were slaves, you said you would free us and now you brought us to a place to die. And yet Moses is doing exactly what God had told him to do. And they're like, this, we had it better back 
in Egypt. And I could imagine them, they're like, we didn't sign up for this. When you told us we were getting free, this was not what we were counting on. This is not what we were looking for. And I think sometimes in our lives as Christians, we have that same kind of idea. We think that when trouble comes our way and there are difficulties and God is moving us and things happen, we're thinking, Lord, I didn't sign up for this. I signed up for your forgiveness. I signed up for that abundant life I heard about. I signed up for eternal life. I didn't sign up for any kind of suffering or difficulty. I didn't sign up for any kind of situation like this where it seems like the enemy is, has the upper hand and I have no way out of this situation. I didn't sign up for this. And we need to recognize that the Lord is at work and he uses us many times in the most desperate situations to make himself known both to this lost world, but also to us. You see, it's difficult for some of us, I think, in the church to realize, but that God will even use suffering and extreme difficulty to teach us something about himself. Because it's interesting, if we would go on in this chapter, we see after God has saved them, it says that Israel knew that he's the Lord and that God showed himself in a way to Israel that they had never seen him before. And God will use difficult times to teach us something about himself that we did not know any, uh, prior to that. When I was uh, graduating from seminary, I was, uh, it was in April, just before August when I would be full time at the seminary teaching. And it was a great time. I mean, we had left our home in Ohio and, and come to Louisville and we, we have fallen in love with Louisville. We enjoy the area, but, uh, but it was a big change for us uh, in many ways. Uh, your pastor um, likes to remind me, I've told him, we, we actually moved into a barn um, when we moved there and it was not a loft kind of nice place. I'm talking about, we lived on the second floor and the steel um, aluminum plating on the top of the barn was our roof um, there as well. I, op I turned the light on one night to go to the bathroom and I counted 38 um, cockroaches. We, we, would, we would wash our dishes before we ate and after we ate because of the conditions we lived in. So uh, um, I, it, it, was, it, it took me a, a long time to to get acclimated, I'll just put it that way, to where God had brought us. But we saw a light at the end of the tunnel. I was getting ready to graduate. The school had called me to um, teach full time as a professor there. And uh, it seemed like this was, this was just a season of life and we are moving on. And uh, another thing uh, in April, uh, about that time, I had, uh, I have two sons, but they were little guys at that time. One was four and the other um, was uh, eight. And we were looking to uh, get them involved in baseball for the first time. Now, if you uh, knew me as a young man, there were three things in my life. There was uh, God and the church. I was very involved in that. Um, there was school. I was very committed to my schoolwork. And then there was baseball. Now, I gave it to you in that order, but it wasn't always in that order um, in my life. But baseball, I mean, it was my life. I would play in the snow. I played baseball where I would run and I'd get sick and then I'd run some more. And uh, it was just... Uh, my life. In fact, I, 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 I came by it honestly. My mom told me and my parents told me that when I was born, she held me and said, this is going to be my baseball player. And so my mom was a big baseball fan. So I don't remember any time not being involved in baseball from my earliest memories. I was playing baseball and just uh, gave myself to it. And they had kind of trained me in that direction. 
And so I was so serious about baseball that when I graduated from school, I did a little coaching when I was in college, but I, the Lord had called me to full-time ministry. I knew that, and I thought, well, there's just no future for me with baseball, so I just walked away from it. Also, it was good for me because baseball by that time became very serious to me. It, it's a game, but I mean, it was very serious. It wasn't just to play for fun. It was, it was serious for me. And I knew that it had gotten a little bit too serious for me. And so I had just walked away completely from it. Well, my wife said, you know, TJ, and we were high school sweethearts, so she knew me back in those days. She said, you need to teach the boys to play baseball. And I said, Ann, I don't want to be one of those parents. You all know what parents I'm talking about, right? Those parents that, you know, they've stopped with these things. And so they're trying to live out their childhood again through their own children and push their children. And I've seen many times where their kids didn't even care about playing ball, but their parents were pushing them. And I said, I don't want to be that parent. I know how I am about baseball, Ian. You know how I am about baseball. And I just don't want to be that way. She says, you, you know how you are and you mellowed over the years. It'll be okay. But she says, you know a lot about baseball and you ought to teach them. So I said, okay, well, she opened up a floodgate. Man, I went to the store and I bought all sorts of equipment. I had like 25 little league baseballs and, and I bought balls and bats and gloves and, and paraphernalia. And uh, I, I took my boys out and my four-year-old, he was in the 25th percentile in height. And he was, he was a little guy, so I put a hat on him and I put this big old glove on him and I said, get in position. And when I did, he'd been down and there was literally um, no space between, you know, his, his hips and the ground by the time he got down in position. And I'd hit that ball to him and uh, he wouldn't move, but if it came straight to him, then he'd catch it, you know? And so it, it was great fun. I just, I had so much fun just teaching them and getting them prepared. Well, we were getting ready that April for their first practice. And so we were getting, we were all excited and, and we were loading up the, the van and uh, we, our house we had had just a single lane um, driveway and I had our other car um, between the, the van and the road. And I, I told the boys, we walked out of the house and I said, hop in the van, I'm gonna move the car and we'll go. And so, I, I went into the car, started the engine, started to back up. And as I did, we had this huge tree in our front yard that dropped limbs a lot. And as I began to pull out, I felt something dragging underneath the car. And I thought, man, that's, it must be a tree limb there. And I, I pulled back forward and stopped. Um, and when I did, I heard a voice. And that voice came from right under me. And I heard this word, daddy. And I'll never forget this. The first thought that ran through my head was you have not ran over your son. But I got out of the car and there I saw my four-year-old, John. And he was pinned underneath the car. He was laying on this side, was on the ground, but he could lift this one arm. The car had him pinned down here this whole part of his face was covered with blood and gravel. I couldn't see anything, his eye or any part of his face at all. And he was looking at me with that one eye, reaching as best he could as I looked and he's crying out, Daddy, Daddy. Well, I thought, you know, can I budge? I couldn't budge. I yelled at my other son. I said, go tell mom inside to call 911. And as he did that and we were waiting for the emergency um, people to come. I, I looked and I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can still pull him out. And when I went to reach in to pull him out, I realized that his legs were not in their proper place, if I put it that way. Both of them were actually just wrapped around his body, upper body. And I, I kept talking with him. I didn't want him to... Um, go into any more shock than what he already was and trying to, to talk with him. And they came, they jacked the car up. The very first thing they did is they straightened his legs out. And that's when he cried out, real cry out pain. And it took many years for him to have any uh, 
kind feelings toward people in uniform because he blamed them for it. And I was always glad for him to blame them instead of me, actually, um, for that. But um, he was rushed to the hospital. It was, it, it was getting late that night, and they took him into emergency surgery. We didn't know the extent of his injuries, of course. And I went off away, and we were in Children's Hospital there in Louisville, and I went, they had a locker room for parents, and I went off, and I was by myself back there, and I just was weeping. And I kept crying out, what have I done to my son? What have I done to my son? I, it's like, I, I can't believe that I've done this. And I was weeping, and that, I just kept saying that. And in the midst of it, I didn't hear an audible voice, but it's as if the Lord spoke to me and said, well, TJ, what did, what did I do to my son? And it dawned on me that there's no way that I would have purposely put my son and done this to my own son. And then I realized that God did send his son to suffer and die for me. And in that moment, I had grown up in church. I had pastored for a number of years by that time, I, almost 14 years. And, and I, I had preached many a sermon about God's love. And I realized in that moment, I don't have an inkling of a clue as to ex the extent of God's love. Because I can't imagine the kind of love that God had and has for us that he would send his son to die for you and me. And as I look back on that, I realize that God used that in a tremendous way in my life. You see, I didn't have a great attitude at that time. Yes, I saw light at the end of the tunnel, but I have to tell you, I didn't happily live in that barn. I didn't happily go through a lot of the things that we went through during that season of our lives. In fact, I was very much complaining and somewhat angry about these things. And yet God used that terrible thing in my life to teach me how can you ever question how much I love you? How can you ever question how much I've done for you? And I haven't. To, to help things, by the way, my son, he came out of surgery and my wife was on one side and I was on the other and he woke up, he saw Ann and he said to her, hi mom. And then he looked at me, first things that come out of his mouth, dad, why'd you run over me with the car? <laughs> That's the first thing. And then people brought him toys. He'd have these little matchbox cars. He said, let me show you what dad did here. I'm here and <laughs> bam, this is what he did here. And uh, he had a full recovery. Um, in fact, at that age, uh, his, they say his bones were stronger than what they were before. Um, I don't understand how that works, but that's what we were told. He's won um, martial arts tournaments and run cross country. Since then, he's getting ready to go in his senior year of high school. And so... We praise God for that. But I say all that to say that God loves us enough that he will take us into places that from our perspective are places we don't want to go to show us just how much he is our Lord and Savior and how powerful he is and how much he does love us and how much we can trust him. And so he takes them to a place where they just don't understand and they begin to, to complain, just like t t seems to be my tendency. When difficulties come, you know what my first prayer is to God? Get me out of this thing. Any of you like that? Anything, get, get rid of this. But you know, I think about the Lord and he prayed, Father, if it be your will, remove this cup from me. But then he continued, didn't he? And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so sometimes the Lord will do this. Another thing I, I see here that I think is important for us to notice is that God 
even uses his enemies for his purposes. You know what? God is not shaken by anything and even his enemies work to do his bidding. It's the Lord who hardens Pharaoh's heart. It's the Lord who leads these Egyptians to do what they're going to do. Now, I don't understand all the reasons why God does what he does, but I do know that he is in control. And I, I'm kind of reminded of this. I, I'm a huge history buff, especially Civil War and, and World War II. I just enjoy studying those things and have spent many years doing that, way too much probably. But um, when I was a kid, um, a friend of, me, of mine introduced me to games where you actually have the actual map of a battlefield. For instance, I had a map of, of uh, um, Belgium and Germany uh, where the Battle of the Bulge was fought. And they had every single landmark. I mean, it was accurate. And you had the exact troops and you would go and, and do these things. And they had, I had one that was of Gettysburg. And uh, I was uh, telling Tony, uh, I think it was last night, I said, I played that, um, the, replayed the Battle of Gettysburg and I won for the Confederates. I, 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 I knew what the mistakes they made and I didn't make those mistakes. And so, I, I've, so I've just been really into it. But when I was a kid, I would play these games by myself. And so I would play one side and then I would play the other side. You know what was great about that? I never lost. I never lost. When I played for the other side, it just seemed like they moved exactly where I knew they were. I don't know how I knew where they were going to move, but I, I figured it out and then I moved right around and I'd beat them every time. You see, the Lord, he's in control and he's not gonna lose. And he even uses the enemy for his purposes. And so if the Lord is not shaken by his enemies, then why should we? If God be for us, who can be against us? I heard one preacher say, if God be for us, everyone else might as well be. And that's exactly right. Because God is the one who fights for us and God is the one who even uses his enemies for his purposes. And this reminds me of something else here we see here. And that is the enemy wishes to subdue and destroy the people of God. You do have an enemy. You need to understand that. And we see this in scripture. The Bible says Satan roams to and fro seeking whom he may devour. There's this world system that we live in that's under the influence of the powers of darkness. And it opposes God's work. It opposes Christ's church. And we see this. The Bible says that we have the enemies of sin and death. There are very real enemies. And we need to recognize that. But God is greater than any of our enemies. And yet sometimes we, if we're not careful, we tend to forget this. And we look at our enemies more than we look to our God. And we need to trust him. But we do have an enemy. He wishes to destroy us. But you know what? Our Lord has already taken care and won the victory by his sacrifice on the cross, his burial, his resurrection. And what we're involved in now is just a mopping up um, situation. The victory has already been won. And it's just looking forward to the end when we will see him face to face. And he will cast out once and for all sin and death and Satan. And we won't deal with those enemies ever again. And so as we look at this, we, we do have enemies. And I think we need to remember this. Also, God uses this, this difficulty to again, show the enemy that he is God. You, we live in a world that's pretty brazen, don't we? Would you agree with me? In fact, I think there was a time where people, at least in our country, would not thumb their nose at God like they do today. Today, people will do things, say things, and act as if they don't care if God hears it or they don't care whether there is a God or not. 
But let me tell you, God is going to make himself known and there's going to come a day. The Bible says all are going to look and see who Jesus Christ is and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that day is coming. And so he does this and we need to realize that he is going to show himself to the enemy and he will not be thwarted by the enemy. He is our divine warrior. And we see this in the text. If you were to read further in chapter 14, he tells the people to go forward. He tells Moses to lift up his staff. And as we see this, the waters part, the people go through on dry land. They reach the other side and then Moses lowers his staff and the waters come down upon the Egyptians as they try to cross to get to the Israelites. And what he says comes true. He says that you will not see these Egyptians ever again and they will not because the Egyptians are not. They are gone. They have been destroyed. And there will be a day when we will see that the enemy is completely rid of and that the Lord has saved his people once and for all. One thing I would mention here as I come to the end of this passage and think about this message is for us, look at verse 29. It says, but the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. God wants us to know that he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. And that's what faith is, isn't it? If you knew everything that God is doing, would it really be faith? It wouldn't be faith because you just know yourself. But what God calls us to do is not to be in on everything he's doing. And what I mean is be in the know of everything he's doing what he calls us to do is to trust him that he knows what he's doing. That's faith, you see. That means being willing to go places where he leads us that from our perspective just don't make sense. It means being willing to do things that from our perspective just don't make sense, but be, being willing to do it because God has called us to do this. It is being willing to show that we truly are a people of faith. Because God wants us to see and experience his salvation and he wants others to see and experience his salvation through the witness of his people who have experienced it themselves. And so God has a purpose in these things. As I close, I think about our Lord Jesus Christ. Does it really make sense? I mean, if we just want to think about human wisdom, Jesus, God's son, sits at the right hand of the Father and he leaves the splendor of heaven and comes down and is born in a dirty manger, stable to a very poor family. And he already, the enemy tries to kill him when he's a little infant. And yet God, his father protects him. And he lives on this earth and he's, he's misunderstood. He's misrepresented. He is ridiculed. And he goes through all of these things. And finally he comes to the place where he's going to die and he realizes the sacrifice and, and even there he says, Father, if it be your will, let this pass from me. I don't want this to happen. But then he says, but what you want, that is what I want. And so your will, not my will. And he went to the cross and he died and he was buried and he rose again. And he did all that because of his joy of knowing that it would glorify his father 
and that it would save his people. And if he is willing to do that and was willing to do that, our savior for us, then who are we not to follow him and to live for him, die for him, to be the people he's called us to be for his glory and to be used to be a light in this world. You see, that's the Lord that we have. And he has called us to follow him wherever he leads. And I'm gonna close with this song. You know this, don't you? I'll, I, I won't sing it, but I'll just say the words. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Is that where you are today? I hope that's your heart. It may be that you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior. Then he's calling you to follow him. He's calling you. And it may be that you are a believer. He's calling you to follow him, to follow him and to be willing to go wherever he leads. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that while from our perspective, it's very difficult for us to understand all that you're doing, but that we know that you are trustworthy. We know that you are wise and that we, because of your wisdom, can follow you with extreme confidence, knowing that you are with us. Father, I pray today for those here who may not know you as Lord and Savior. I pray that they would realize that salvation comes from the Lord, that it is in one name and one name only, Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray for believers this morning that as you have spoken to us, that we would respond in willingness and desire and commitment to follow you wherever you lead us, to trust you in whatever circumstance that you lead us into. And that we would have the heart of Christ and say, not our will, but your will be done. It is in the strong name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. I'm going to ask your pastors to come and I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, at this time. We're going to have a time of invitation. And this really isn't my invitation. It's not even your pastor's invitation, but it's the Lord's invitation to you to respond to him. And however he would lead you to respond, you come as we sing.